If you're coming over from the previous video, we left off with four, six, and one snails that were homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive, respectively. We then calculated the allele frequencies and we plugged that into the Hardy Weinberg principle of equilibrium equation. And we got um, some different decimals that were our frequencies of the population of each of those different genotypes. And then we converted those back into snails and we got numbers such as 4.5, 5, 5 1.4. And the question was, was, was the expected population that Hardy Weinberg told us, is that what our original population was? Now on the surface, the answer is no, right? 4.5 is not the same as four, but we need to use statistics to statistically test, is that number significantly different than the other or not? And so that's what this video is. It's just a crash course into statistics in general. So a lot of the principles we'll talk about will apply to many different types of statistical scenarios, but we're going to focus mostly on just how we're going to use statistics for Hardy-Weinberg. So in general, the statistics across the board, not just for Hardy-Weinberg, is really to tell us the differences between numbers. Are two numbers similar to each other or are they different from each other? How big is that difference? And so all statistics, whether we're doing it for Hardy-Weinberg, whether we're doing t-tests or ANOVAs or non-parametric tests or whatever, all statistics uses this idea of a null hypothesis. Now you're probably familiar with the term hypothesis because that's kind of what science is built on. It's the foundation of science. You have these ideas of what's happening in the world and you test them. Statistics is similar, but statistics works with a null hypothesis. And here you can see that a null hypothesis is denoted H sub zero. That zero is null, which means nothing. In statistics, our hypothesis is that nothing is happening. There's no difference between those numbers. Uh, there's no changes in those numbers, that those numbers are the same. Statistics assumes that is true, that whatever you're looking at is the same. A statistical test will output a number, we'll talk more about that soon, that essentially says, well, what's the likelihood that's correct? What's the likelihood that, yeah, nothing's happening? Or what's the likelihood of, wow, that there's got to be something happening here? So a null hypothesis is always going to be nothing is happening. Now, in the worksheet that we were using to follow uh, this problem that we're doing with the snails, there is a snippet for this uh, for the statistics part of it. So question 4a is essentially asking, okay, what is our null hypothesis? Our question, our research question is, was that snail population in equilibrium? Well, remember Hardy-Weinberg's equilibrium says the population is stable, aka the population is not changing. So Hardy-Weinberg, that principle is actually a null hypothesis. So in our problem, our null hypothesis is our population is not changing. Our population is not different uh, or, or undergoing evolution. Our population is stable. Now I gave you a whole bunch of different examples. You don't need all of those in your answer, but they're all saying the same thing. The moral of the story is our population of snails is not changing. It is staying stable, which would mean nothing is happening. Now again, this null hypothesis, that was what we're using for Hardy-Weinberg. Null hypotheses exist in other statistical tests as well. Now I mentioned before that all statistical tests are going to lead to a value, and that value is called the p-value. Now for those of you who have a statistical background, you might notice that some of the ways I describe things aren't exactly right. They're not wrong, but they're not the true statistical way of describing something. And that's because this is an intro biology course and I'm trying to get you through statistics. And as you take statistics course, you'll be like, ah, I understand why she didn't give us the long convoluted definition because that was just way too many words. Um, so I'm warning you now, if you've taken statistics, you might be like, well, that's not 100% the definition, but it is a good working definition. So all statistical tests are going to eventually lead to a p-value, and a p-value is the percent likelihood that your null hypothesis is correct. 
Because it's a percent likelihood, you can think of it as a frequency, it's going to range somewhere between 0 and 1. 1 would be 100%. 100% likelihood your null hypothesis is correct. Okay, so, so nothing's happening. Or it could be p could equal 0 0.000001, which would be 0.001% likelihood our null hypothesis is correct. Well, that's a pretty small number. And because that's a pretty small number, our null hypothesis probably isn't correct. So the p-value is a way to evaluate how much support we have for our null hypothesis. But then the question is, I mean, you know p is between 0 and 1. Like, at what point do we say, yeah, it's not the null hypothesis, like something's happening. And so that threshold, that point where we say, yeah, null hypothesis, we totally agree, or huh, maybe something happening here. That threshold is called the alpha value. So that alpha value is going to say, oh, um, at 0 0.5, if it's greater than this, we're going to accept the null. And if, if, we, um, if it's lower than this, we reject it or whatnot. So the alpha value is kind of the threshold where we're going to make those decisions about whether or not we're going to keep our null hypothesis or throw it out and say something is actually happening not just in science, uh, not just in like STEM, but also in our social sciences and really in statistics in general, the most commonly used alpha value is 0 0.05. Or if you want to interpret it differently, about 5% likelihood our null hypothesis is correct. So this is a really, really um, small margin of error that you've got to have less than 5% likelihood your null hypothesis is correct in order to be like, yeah, something's happening here. Now let's talk about how that 0 0.05 falls. So I am going to draw um, very, very briefly, so almost like a number line. So again, P can range from 0 to 1. And I'm going to put 0 0.5, here's 0 0.25. Sorry for the chicken scratch, 0 0.75. So all that matters is where P is in relation to 0 0.05. So if P is less than 0 0.05, if I want to interpret this a little bit differently, if P is less than 5%, that means there's a less than 5% chance that our null is correct. So if our P is falling, you know, all the way down here, wherever my mouse just went, so if P is falling all the way down here at 0 0.05, it's just this, 0 0.05, 0 0.04, 0 0.03, etc. If it's really, really small, we're going to reject our null hypothesis. We're going to say, you know what, this is a really small likelihood our null hypothesis is correct. And because it's so small, something else is going on here. It, it's only 2% likely it's correct. Something else must be happening here. In the case of Hardy-Weinberg, that something else would be, hey, our population's not in equilibrium. That could be because natural selection is happening. Evolution is happening to this population for whatever reason, natural selection, non-random mating, etc. So another way to rem remember this, this is something I learned in my biology class when I was in college, is if P is low, so if P is really small, you reject the hoe. So if P is low, you reject the hoe. Hoe being H sub zero. So hopefully that doesn't offend anyone, but it's a great kind of uh, way to memorize it. On the flip side, you can have P larger than 0 0.5. You know, P could be 0 0.73. There's a 73% chance that your null hypothesis is correct. Well, that's a pretty high likelihood. And, and it's a high enough likelihood that I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's probably the null hypothesis. Yeah, there's nothing happening. It's pretty stable. So P greater than 0 0.5 just means, yeah, there's a greater than 5% chance that the null is correct. And so what we do is we fail to reject the null. Another way you can think of this is we accept the null. That is not the pure scientific statistical way of interpreting a large P value. It is failing to reject your null hypothesis. Again, for this course, it's for simplicity's sake. If you want to say accept, you can. But in reality, it's just 
you either reject your null hypothesis or you fail to reject your null, null hypothesis. Yeah, we're not going to go into why that is. If you take a statistical class, they explore that a lot. But this is the language that we use. Now, if you're using that worksheet, um, questions 4B, 4C, and 4D all just have quick review questions relating to this information, but then applying it to Hardy-Weinberg. So I, you feel free to pause this video and then fill those in and come back. All right, so we now pretty much have most of our statistical uh, understanding. There are lots of different statistical tests out there, and I'm going to go ahead and just tell you which statistical test we're going to be using. And the statistical test that we're using is the chi-square statistical test, and we're going to use this to uh, accept or fail to reject or reject our null hypothesis. You will be given this equation, um, but the equation itself is pretty straightforward. So this is chi-square. It's going to be very tempting for you to just solve for chi or the, the x. You don't. You keep it as a square. So it stays chi-square. Do not square root anything. Chi-square equals sigma. Sigma means the sum of O minus E squared over E. O is the observed values. And in our next video, I'm going to run through this with the values we came up with. But observed would be, what was our population? Like, how many snails of each color did we have? Expected is what Hardy-Weinberg told us. Hardy-Weinberg said, well, based on your allele frequencies, here's how many big R, big R's you should expect to see. So we are just plugging in numbers y'all have already solved for. Now, you might have noticed is that we're solving for chi-square in that previous um, question. And I just put a random number here. So we plugged in numbers. We got chi-square equals 1.268. But what, what do we do with that? Like I told you before that, that all statistical tests lead to a p-value. And that p-value is universal. That p-value we can interpret. What about chi-square, though? So if you have taken a statistics course, if you've opened up a statistics book, you flip through the book and you flip through the book, and at the very end, you get all of these statistical tables. It is just pages and pages of numbers. And it's essentially a table that helps you to convert, so to speak, your statistical test number, such as our chi-square number, into a p-value. And so here I'm going to show you a snippet of it. The chi-square statistical table is huge. Like, all of them are huge. I have given you a small portion of it. And we have to use this table to figure out what our p-value is. So let me help you break down this table real quick. So we have df. So df stands for degrees of freedom. In this course, we are not going to explore it much. I'm going to tell you vaguely what it is. Uh, in, in a statistics course or higher biology courses, you'll use degrees of freedom a lot more. So df means degrees of freedom. And the way you calculate how many degrees of freedom you have in your statistical test, you're going to take the number of variables you had and subtract one. Now, if you think back to Hardy-Weinberg, the, 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 the numbers we use were p squared plus 2pq plus q squared. You might think, oh, we had three variables then, right? We had three different terms. But think about it. How many variables did we actually have? We didn't have three. We had two. We had P and we had Q. We had three terms, but we only used those two variables. So with Hardy-Weinberg, we have two variables, P and Q, minus one. That's how you just solve for degrees of freedom. So in our problem, we have one degree of freedom. Every Hardy-Weinberg problem we do in this course will have one degree of freedom. So honestly, you can just memorize, okay, it's one degree of freedom. But that's where that number is coming from. Along the top of this, we have 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. These are essentially p-values. So for example, if you have a chi-square value of 0 0.455 exactly, the corresponding p-value is 0 0.5. If you have a chi-square value of 6.635, your p-value is 0.01. Now, obviously, this doesn't have every number, 
So what we do is we compare our chi-square value and figure out where it would be. So 1.268 would be here. 1.268 is somewhere between 0 0.4 and 2.7, which means my p-value is somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Now you might be like, okay, but, but what number is it? That doesn't matter. Because in reality, all we care about is, is p larger than 0 0.05 or is it smaller than 0 0.05? That is all we care about. So here, I know my chi-square value falls between these two. That means my p-value is somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. That's pretty large. So our p-value is greater than 0 0.05. And what do we do with that again? p is high. So we're going to fail to reject it, aka on the, on the side, we're accepting it. But we're failing to reject our null hypothesis. We're saying, yeah, nothing's, we don't have enough evidence to say that anything is going on here. So again, this was just a crash course into statistics and um, that we're going to use for Hardy-Weinberg, but keep some of the things we talked about in, in, in the back of your head, because later in this course, we're going to use other statistical tests, and a lot of these principles are the same. Our next video is going to go back to our problem with snails and use that chi-square formula in order to finish out and come up with a conclusion of if our population is in equilibrium.